Welcome everybody to the London Spanish Book and Cine Fair 2020. Tonight we have the honor to present Patria Roman and Jessica Rettis, who will talk about the recently published book Narratives of Migration, Latin Americans in London. At the end of the session, the authors will answer your questions, which will be presented by Teresa Guanique, director of Flawa Festival. Hoping you enjoy the event, please welcome Sylvia Roslisberger, who will chair this webinar. Thank you. Hello, thank you for joining us today. And welcome to Narrative of Migration, Latin Americans in London, a conversation with researchers and writers, Patria Roman Velázquez and Jessica Retis. I am going to start by introducing our two guests. Patria Roman Velázquez is a senior lecturer in the Institute of Media and Creative Industries at Loughborough University, London. Patria is a sociology and communication specialist with an interest in urban communication, migrant and ethnic economies, and urban regeneration. Patria is the author of the book, The Making of Latin London, Salsa, Music, Place, and Identity. She is co-author of Narratives of Migration, Relocation, and Belonging. Latin Americans in London. In London. Patria Roman Velázquez is also founder and chair of trustees at Latin Elephant, a charity that works with migrant and ethnic groups to increase inclusion, engagement, and participation in processes of urban regeneration. Patria Roman Velázquez, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation, Sylvia. Always a pleasure to work with you. Thanks, Patria. Um, Jessica Retis is Associate Professor in the School of Journalism and Director of the Masters in Bilingual Journalism at the University of Arizona. She is affiliated faculty with the Center for Latin American Studies and the Human Rights Practice Program at EUA. Retis holds a major in communications, a Masters in Latin American Studies, and a PhD in Contemporary Latin America. She is co-editor of the Handbook of Diasporas, Media and Culture and co-author of Latin Americans in London, Narratives of Migration, Relocation and Belonging. Jessica is joining us today from Arizona, USA. Welcome, Jessica Retis. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Thanks for the interest in hearing what we have to say. Bienvenidos. At the center of this book, of this talk, is the book Narratives of Migration, Relocation, and Belonging, Latin Americans in London, which is a product of a research done by Patria and Jessica about migration of Latin Americans to Europe with a specific reference to London. As the book points out, there is little research done about Latin, Amer about Latin American migration to Europe, and in particular to the UK. The book does mention all the, re all the research done so far and expands on how Latin American migrants create networks of solidarity and spatial spheres. Around migration, routes into London, workspaces, diasporic media, and urban places. So Patria and Jessica, tell us about um, your decision of working together in the book and what you plan to accomplish with this investigation. Yeah, um, me and Jessica uh, know each other um, since um, 2006, and we met in La Plata in Argentina with another good colleague, and we still work together. Um, then we sort of coincided um, through research and, and, and common research in Latin Americans in, in Spain, which she had done before me in London. And we met in London a few years after that. So we've always been collaborating, talking about probably <laughs> working together. Um, and so I was as well, you know, um, with this book for a very long time and I've been researching and doing interviews for, for a very long time, but needed a little bit of a wider context that put it in the context of Europe, for example. And I just thought Jessica was the, 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 the great partner because she had Europe and she also had the United States. So it helped us uh, in a way contextualize the issue of Latin American diasporas and Latin American migration in a, in a slightly broader context beyond London. And that's how the collaboration came into being really. For what I could see from, from reading the book, 
the research Patria did in the 1990s about, about London, about salsa and urban spaces, and the work and the research that Jessica did while doing her PhD in Madrid about migration of Latin Americans to Europe was like the base of, of the, the next step of the research that you made in this book. So I found that you really both like complemented each other very well. Mm -hmm. In the book, you explain the differences and parallels between US Latinidad and British Latinidad. Can you expand on your findings about these two? Yeah, um, I'll talk a little bit about British Latinidad and what I observed from London, and then I will leave Jessica to to talk a bit more about um, uh, parallels with with US um, Latinidad. In 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 London, what I feel that I see is a tension between um, a desire to define itself against all colonial powers through the issue of Latin America. Latin America is a political project and, and an ideological sort of project. So it's a post-colonial self-definition against these old colonial powers on one side versus having um, a, another one, which is more strategic, and it's um, the proclamation of Ibero-American, which is more about a strategic positioning about numbers and not necessarily about um, the needs of a particular group and a, a, and a sort of political and, and ethnic sort of project. Um, that tension of the Latin and the Ibero, it's embedded, that amalgamation is, is embedded in concepts of British Latinidad, I say, I, I think. You cannot um, understand one without the other in that respect. And it's part of how we need to understand this is sort of historical practices and material practices through which we understand British, what we call British Latinidad in, in, in that respect. So I don't know, Jessica, you want to come here? Perhaps? Yes. Uh, so we, um, well, it's a... Uh, very complex um, approach in trying to understand this. Uh, certainly we need to have uh, contemporary um, history and the understanding of um, the history, the present and the future, right, of being Latino. Um, and this is very interesting because it's a, it's a paradox uh, on the conception of um, Latin America itself. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, uh, for example, myself, right? I, I was an immigrant in Mexico and I was turned Peruvian. Then I was a mean, an immigrant in, in Spain and I was a South American, right? And then when I moved to California, uh, all of a sudden I became a Latina. Uh, so the issues about identity and self-representation, it's always relational, relational right? So it's, it's how you see yourself how you see your community and how you see your community in relation with otherness, right? So in that regard, the, present, uh, the presence of um, Latinx communities, and also we can include the Latinx, uh, we can talk about that uh, later on, which is a, a pan-ethnic uh, um, label that is recently being embraced, especially from the academia and for um, other areas we can talk about later on. But uh, talking about Latin dad, um, uh, the beginning, the history and the presence of, of uh, Latin Americans in the United States, uh, as you might know, we are talking about mainly uh, Mexicans in the Southwest and then Puerto Ricans, right? So these two groups uh, somehow also relate to um, um, the entire population in the, in the United States. Throughout the years, we have been having different but ethnic labels uh, whether Hispanic, Latinos, Chicanos, Tejanos, right? New Yorkans, uh, et cetera, right? So those, all these different ethnic levels has uh, different specificities uh, and geographies as well, right? And, and also they have a momentum in the history, right? So um, in the 70s and the 80s, when the larger migration from Latin America started coming, to the United States, no US born uh, Latinos because Mexicans and Puerto Ricans have been here before um, um, the, the, um, the, the country was built the way it is geographically. Uh, the, uh, basically the administration was trying to put together this group of people uh, and then decided to, 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 to use the, the, the label Hispanics, right? 
Uh, so that was very interesting because it all started from uh, top to bottom. But then what that, that particular uh, patent labels have been used also for marketing purposes, right? And then uh, this idea of Hispanic as related to Spain, and we go back to what Patria was saying, mm -hmm. the relationship with the metropolis, right? And the colonial perspective, uh, turn around into, okay, what is to be Latino, right? As opposed to what the administration is saying that we are Hispanics. And um, the constant, this um, critical perspective on uh, Latino and embracing this idea, generating in the academia this uh, conceptualization of, of Latinidad as a way to put in the center this um, collective identity, which is very interesting because it also reflects uh, heterogeneity. And in some of in my uh, publications, I have talked about how heterogeneous we are, Latinos, Latin Americans. We can be white, we can be indigenous, we can be brown, we can be Asian, we speak different languages. So we cannot be um, concentrating in just one panethnic level, right? So with Patria, what we're trying to understand is, okay, oh, how about all these discussion on this collective identity uh, can be reflected in uh, UK and how Latinos, Latinx, Latin American immigrants in UK and specifically in London are, are thinking about themselves. Mm -hmm. I can totally relate with what you mentioned about if you're in Spain, your relationship to, to who you are, or if you're in the US or if you're in the UK, I think that with most Latin Americans in the UK that I talk to and share experiences, we all say like, I arrived to London being Colombian but here I become I become Latin American. Like I realize that um, like it's it's my identity in a way, like Latin American rather than only Colombian. Mm -hmm. In the book, you explain. I oh, know. Sorry, I read that question. Ah, right? uh, yeah. In the book, you argue that identity is not just about representation, but about understanding the historical processes and material practices. Tell, about, tell us about this concept of identity that you use to base your research upon. Yeah, I think this draws exactly on what Jessica is, is, is explaining. And um, here we draw on a long tradition of sort of research by Stuart Hall on, on cultural identities and identities. And it is about um, understanding the, the, the present in its relationship with the past, but also with the future. So it's basically about how we understand sort of the material practices um, in the present, but in relation to that historical, colonial at times and quite violent past for understanding um, people's sense of identity and belongingness, um, but also with a sense of not necessarily being stuck in the past, but also about the future, about transformation, about how it sort of develops in relation to its context in, in that respect and always being in, in, in a constant sort of flux and, and, and process of transformation about its relationship to the geographical places as well in which you are um, placed at a particular context, which is what Jessica was saying as well, you know, um, in a similar instance, for example, for me, am I Caribbean, am I Latin American, am I Puerto Rican, um, and so on. Um, um, and I think that this is the, the, the main concept which we draw from um, in relation to, to, to cultural identity and its relationship with places that Stuart Hall um, uh, sort of introduced, I think, in the 1990s or so. Um, and he's been working with that for a very long time, also sort of um, originally from Jamaica, Black British Caribbean um, scholar. Um, in that. And also the fact that we have been collaborating in this, you, uh, Silvia, should see us, uh, you know, exchanging ideas and getting very passionate and trying to understand because we are also uh, part of the subject that we are researching about, which is a very interesting position as researchers, because we've, we, we have been feeling that situation, right? And so we are, in, we, we decided to go into this most postmodern perspective, sociological perspective, into um, being aware of our own reality and how we try to understand the reality of our communities. 
And I think that's the soul of the book. We are trying to understand and we're trying to tell, uh, you know, the, the, the audience, the academic audience, and also hopefully the book is going to be useful for different uh, sectors of our society in understanding our specificities, our complexities, mm -hmm. our needs, our, our claims right in different areas so and and we see this book as a as a beginning of our conversation in the book but it's the first step because we have so many other uh projects for the future but basically it's is is this i found really interesting the idea you used of roots routines and roots mm -hmm. to capture the sense of belonging to to the place yeah, I use that back in, in my PhD thesis or that book that then was converted into book of the making of Latin London. And I like this, roots as in the past, um, roots as in trajectories and routines as, as, as things that we constantly sort of do to sort of remind ourselves of, of, of who we are or what we were and where we're going in that respect. Um, and I, I like that because it captures the past, the present and the future in that concept of identity, of movement, of transformation. Um, it's a trajectory. And I also think like what we wanted to capture in the book, if you follow um, the book through its chapters, is, is a trajectory of, of a person, of a migrant person, for example, of us as migrant women, but of many of, 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 of us Latin Americans. So it's how they left, you know, the, the, the idea of how they left um, and came into London, how they find their work, how they're represented and, and their spaces in media, and then the urban spaces. So it's sort of, in a way, captures and claiming a right to a city, captures that trajectory as well. So, I, yeah, I quite like the way in which it sort of can be read very differently as well. Um, talking about traject traject trajectories, three different migration routes of Latin Americans who settle in London have been identified. So what are these three migratory circuits? I think I'll leave Jessica to that because that <laughs> comes more into Jessica. So we have topic. 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, but very so, briefly. <laughs> so basically what we're trying to address here is uh, in the in the demographic context is how Latin Americans have been invisible in the immigration debate, in non-European immigration debate, in general in Europe, right? And then specifically in the UK and in London. So of course there are uh, pioneer studies surveys that have been talking about invisibility and the claim for visibility. So this is very important for us to understand, especially for um, the, the, the uh, people in the UK, right? So to understand that relationship between uh, Britain and Latin America goes way back to the past, even into the relationship when uh, the independence uh, movement started, right? And the implications of the British uh, in, in, um, 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 metropolis in, in, this, in this area. So it was very interesting when we were doing the history of Latino media, for example, we found that the oldest oh, Spanish know. language right. newspaper mm -hmm. was Colombian, was a Colombiano, right? It was someone that was trying to lobby in uh, the British capital about uh, these this necessities of, uh, for the um, independence. Uh, independence movements. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the same if we talk up, if we think about the, span, the oldest Spanish language publication in the US, which was in the, in the Mississippi, in New Orleans. It was also this sort of uh, idea of uh, circulating these uh, needs, right? Of, of the different um, groups in Latin America. So if we go back to that, then we will see that what, you know, demographers talk about is uh, how population flows follow the capital flows, right? So there's a reason why we, we do have Colombians in the majority of, of, of the Latin Americans coming from Colombia. There's a reason why we have uh, groups of Brazilians uh, in the UK because there, there is a liaison before that and I, I invite people to read the, that chapter because there's a lot of information there uh, in order to understand that uh, contrary as public discourse tend to say that immigrants come because they are poor, quote unquote, it's um, more complex than that. So population flows re really follow the capital flow by the other way around. And it's interesting because also the capital flow goes back to the countries of origins in the, in the way of remittances, right? Uh, also in uh, the capital flow goes back in the way of family reunification. 
and it's very complex. In the case of UK, for example, it's very interesting because we found in our uh, field work that we're not only uh, finding, let's say, uh, Silvia talking about Colombians, right? We're not only uh, finding Colombians coming from Colombia to London, but also Colombians uh, going through the second or third migratory processes because they were already in Madrid or they were already in Valencia and then things didn't work the way they, they were expecting. And then they go back, they go to London because they have a friend, a family, you know, immigrate, uh, immigrant networks, right? Mm -hmm. And because of Brexit and those situations, uh, this is how we end the, the book. Uh, we are concerned about what is going to happen to Latino communities because of two, two concomitant processes that happen, right? One is Brexit and the other one is the pandemic that we're, that we're, uh, we're living to it, uh, uh, right now. So those two situations, are gonna definitely uh, if, uh, affect uh, the Latino community. So uh, things are going to start moving again, right? In, in other directions. So uh, long story short, I would say, we need to think about the different historical processes. We need to think about uh, pull and push uh, effects, both in countries of origins and countries of destiny. We need to think about second, third and fourth migratory process. We need to think about the transnational lives because you don't have to leave your country to participate in the migratory process. You, you will have a kid back in Bogota, you're gonna keep sending money there and then hopefully you want to reunite with your kid or maybe you, you think about going back, right? So we, uh, the photograph is not static. We are a movement. So Latin Americans were becoming very transnational. We, we have around 30 million Latin Americans living abroad in a different place where they, 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 they were born. So this is our reality. Yeah. So, um, so you think, what I, for what I write in the book and also write in, in, past, in past research about the, the migratory routes about the 70s and the 80s, when from the South Cone, Latin America started coming, uh, running away for planet in a way, for, from political turmoil. And then in the 90s from Colombia, and uh, Ecuador and Peru because of uh, economic instability. And then the third wave that are Latin Americans coming from Spain. And I find interesting that you say there's going to be a new wave. There is going to be consequence of Brexit and a consequence of, of the pandemic, basically. Mm -hmm. My next question is how have Latin Americans asserted their rights to the city in their search for social and spatial justice throughout our short history as a diaspora community in the UK? Yeah, here I think I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. I, I, I see this as um, Latin Americans sort of asserting their right to participate in different processes, um, po political, cultural, um, and 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 their right to belong and to be recognized as such in London. Um, and this is, um, well, the, the most um, sort of perhaps um, recent one that most people in London might think of is um, a violent process of gentrification and regeneration that is decimating our communities to big spaces that have been um, uh, closed down basically um, to give way to new developments um, and our communities are being um, in a way chattered by the experience and they are asserting their right to the city, their right to belong, to be part of it, to be recognized, to be listened, to be heard. But there's other spaces that are not necessarily so much um, physical but also cultural for example in the arts um, in academia, for example, as well. Um, a lot of the uh, sort of different spaces that Latin Americans are occupying, political space, counselors, for example, um, is this right to belong and to be heard. And, 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 and that is some of the things that I sort of discuss. And I think um, we open the book with um, the experiences, for example, of Flower um, as a new sort of movement of, of, of um, uh, sort of in, in a way um, representing women in the arts, right, in, in that respect. Um, and there are others like um, 
other sort of projects by Latin American charities, but also by other individuals, Jimena Pardo, for example, Borando la Memoria, Flawa, um, Talentos, which um, groups, which is um, takes over like Big Ben and does a, a spectacle. It's about asserting your right to be there and to be seen in the most sort of performative ways that you can in that sense. So it's about a right to 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 belong, like a right to to to, to be heard um, in different spaces. So physical spaces, but also not so physical, right? In the arts and political and economic sort of sense in that respect. Um, and that's that's how Latin Americans have, I think, uh, developed like from 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 a sense of uh, we are here um, and we arrive to we are here to stay right um, in in that sense. I really enjoyed from the book like seeing all these projects and like flowers you mentioned and um, uh, Latinos in London talentos and to read to see all the all these projects being acknowledged and being documented for future reference and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I found that really interesting. Um, the book has a table as well that tries to capture uh, as many as we could. And I, and, and I do have to apologize because perhaps we didn't. <laughs> um, we left so many others outside that we don't know. And there's so much happening. But it is a first attempt to try and map out a bit um, mm -hmm. the different sort of cultural events um, and, and, and media spaces as well. Some much more formal than others. But it was a, a way of trying to capture of a particular moment, uh, though, you know, I'll be incomplete in a way. <laughs> I can't say that we've um, done justice to all that exists out there in, in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, the book addresses how social networks are the first point for Latin Americans to get their first job in the UK and how once with work, the routines of Latin Americans in London gravitate around work shift patterns and commuting to work, mm -hmm. which is like, the, the routines part of roots, routines and roots that we were talking at the beginning. So uh, tell us about these experiences you found in your research. Yeah, this goes back to, um, so, so some years where I was, um, I'm always been interested in this idea of roots, roots and routines. And um, here I was um, trying to capture, um, the idea was to capture how people moved around the city and how people adapted to, to, to the city and sort of uh, um, understood the city. And this, of course, in, in my first sort of book, I explore in relation to um, immigration status and how the fear of, for example, um, um, being undocumented um, led people to develop certain strategies around how movements through the city. And here I was more interested in just figuring out, you know, how people move in the city, how people understand a city like London and how people, um, um, what, what people do. And what are the things that we found out? And this was a research that I did with, with um, also with Jacob um, Lagnado, who was um, the research assistant for, for this particular project, and Lucia Oriana. And one of the things that we found in that particular project was that people spent, um, in, in their mapping and talking about where they went and how, people spent a great deal of time um, going to and from work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at times sort of, going at four in the afternoon, not coming back to four o'clock in the morning and different shifts, right? Three shifts throughout the night, moving from one bus to the other, um, walking from one place to the other. And so it tries to capture that sort of um, very precarious um, rhythms of, 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 of workers and in particular um, sort of low skill sort of workers. And most of them were working at that time in, in, in cleaning sort of sectors um, in the city of London. So it captures that and it captures um, in, in a very, I believe, sensitive way. It also captures some of the ideas um, around conflict, um, about sort of um, co-ethnic if you want exploitation at times as well um, but it also talks about process of solidarity and about um, coming together through the same um, share or through an experience of shared precarity in, 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 in work and cities um, and cities that they sometimes find um, quite inhospitable because of their migratory status or because of their ethnicity for example or because of their gender so the book or that particular chapter tries to capture 
those um, experiences of, of Latin Americans in the white place, how they find their first work, for example, but also how they, um, how, how he occupies a lot of their time moving to and from work, dominated their everyday routines, basically, um, which is not something that we perhaps necessarily were, were thinking, right, in, uh, when we started the research. In chapter six of Narratives of Migration, Relocation and Identity, um, it is about Latin media spaces in London. So how do diasporic media challenge exclusion, stereotyping and homogenized representation in mainstream media cultures? Mm -hmm. So um, this is very interesting to see when you compare the different uh, ways in which different immigrant communities um, settle, right? In different cities. Uh, so once people come, because they, they come for, to, to work, right? So that that's one thing that we need to understand. They come to work because the city is opening the spaces for them uh, and low wages uh, works, unfortunately, right? And they, they settle down in the, in the periphery of the labor market, right? So they can high qualify and also for services, etc. So th there is a situation when in the first stage of the, in the immigration process and the settlement, mm -hmm. the organizations started uh, happening, right? Like Casa Latina, etc. Right? So that's Casa Latina. So th those those Latina. are the organizations that start, right? Yeah. Then uh, around those areas, also the different ethnic um, enterprises, right? Uh, 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 the cafeteria, the unfortunately, Latin elephant, what well, we all know, is that, is that, well, I'll, I'll let Patria talk about that, but uh, the different uh, restaurants and, you know, peluquerias, etc. right? And then there's a combination of need to self representation, but also from these different organizations and uh, restaurantes and different uh, businesses, right? that need to spread the word about what they are offering for the communities. Yeah. So all these different situations uh, help the emergence of media that specifically cater this type of communities, right? At the very beginning in Spanish, because we all speak Spanish or in Portuguese in case of uh, Brazilians and, and Portuguese immigrants in London, right? And then somehow in, the, in Portuñol, right, sometimes. Uh, so we should think about the sporic media and ethnic media as part of the other types of organizations and businesses. So it's, it's, that's why we complement each other because Patria was already looking at, and we have even interviewed the same people. Sometimes when we were out there interviewing people or observing, right? Uh, whatever is happening in the city, right? So this is part of this, um, complex reality of uh, different processes of identity, self-representation and communication. The other thing is that as the same as the Latino communities, we don't close our liaison with back home. So you will go to a restaurant, Colombian restaurant, and then you can hear musica from uh, the, 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 the radio station that you used to, right? So with internet, things have evolved, but we go back in time I have been conducting research in London and then someone would offer me CDs for the telenovela colombianas, right? Uh, because people, right? You remember that, right? Missing the, 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 the telenovela colombiana and then you will go, right? So Ecuadorians and missing the pasillos, right? And then you have a, that registration that gives your sense of back. It's like, I'm, I'm here and there, right? So this is very important to understand because it's, it's not simple. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it's not um, 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 a static situation. Uh, so that happened in the 80s and the 90s, right? The majority of Latino media in the, in the next bunch of media in the 90s in London, but then internet happened, right? And then you, you, are going to, you, you were able to, do, to, to consume here and there because you're, 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 you want to see whatever is happening in your home country, but you also want to see when is Juan is going to play in London, right? Because, and we've been there, Patria and myself, dancing with Juanes, right? And <laughs> we've been there. So we want to, and we want to know what is a good Peruvian ceviche, right? And then we've been there, right? So this is, this is part of the community, right? So, and the, the fact that uh, this is regarding uh, Latino media, 
The other part that we need to understand is uh, mainstream media echoes what's happening in the public discourse. And uh, we have seen and we have uh, written and we uh, in our literature review, uh, there was a situation where Latino immigrants were not counted mm -hmm. uh, in uh, census, etc. And then so many scholars have been um, demanding this um, showing of the numbers of Latin, Latin Americans in London. So if the administration is not understanding the presence of Latinos, media is going to reflect that. So that's why when you try to look at the news uh, representation of Latinos, mm -hmm. it's almost inexistent, right? And that relates to whatever is happening in the US. If you see mainstream media in the US, less than 1% of the news media, it's about Latin Americans and Latinos when we are close to 20%, right? And when we do appear, guess what? It's, it's about idea. social mm -hmm. conflicts, right? So there is first an invisibility in the mainstream media discourse and representation. And second, when we do appear, it's like victims of victimizing, right? So, and, and that's problematic. So we should take that into consideration. Again, it's complex because I've been interviewing different uh, British journalists and then somehow they need to understand these complex realities of, mm -hmm. of Latinos, right? Complex realities. So, and then in, in, in top of that, on top of that, the, how we relate to other groups, right? Uh, and then I'm gonna let Patrick <laughs> finish the idea, right? Because we've been talking about that like for so many uh, years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's basically about sort of um, how Latin Americans here also relate to other ethnic media and how that's becoming, or, or I feel is sort of beginning to, to develop in which um, different outlets of ethnic media and different communities becoming much more integrated in certain ways. So what you see is now you have Latin Americans um, appearing in spaces in sort of much more sort of local radio stations or magazines that are developed by different ethnic groups in which then the Latin American um, sort of theme becomes part of. So it's, uh, it's, it's creating a space within the minorities if, if you want um, to, to express it in that sort of way, um, which Jessica has a, a, a nice... Um, way of putting all of this, which is like Latin America is a minority within a minority, right? Which is really um, in, in that respect, um, I think it captures what Latin American media is. Latin American media in the UK is very much a minority within a minority, let alone representation of mainstream um, um, media here, where again, it's all about conflicts. It's about the typical sort of um, issues um, that are stereotypes of, of, of Latin America. Um, you know, when you mention, when you see Colombia, it's because there's something about sort of drugs, for example. When I saw a, a page um, sort of layout um, double in, in the Guardian about Puerto Rico, it was because it was conflicts and it was armed police in the university, right? Or a hurricane. Um, it's hardly um, any other um, news about that. But they, this is a bigger issue, I think. This is a bigger issue um, about issues of representation of minorities in mainstream media in, in particular. And, and uh, if I may add, just uh, yes, talk about, uh, that's a problem of journalism in general, yeah. because journalism in general is counted the conflict. So there is a new trend talking about solutions journalism, right? So we were trying to implement that. Uh, we uh, I'm also, I'm in Arizona because we are uh, launching uh, a master's in bilingual journalism here uh, with the intention of better prepare journalists to better understand uh, the specificities of migrations and diversity within our society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a journalist, I found this chapter really interesting. And uh, I think this is like a great first attempt into researching all the media and our inclusion in media and what we can do to get more involved in media. And in regards of what Walter was saying, and Jessica as well about, about stereotyping, in, 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 the media, in, the, in the media sector. Like when I arrived here and I would talk with people about literature, like someone would say like, oh, I wrote a book from, from about Colombia. And I thought it would be like fiction. And then they would say like, yeah, about 
drug cartels. And then I would be like, but that's not the only literature that is produced there. So that's why I decided to, to, to create Literary South to talk about the other literature, I mean, the literature of Latin America, which is not what people thought, like when people think about books from Latin America, they go up about mm -hmm. books about dictatorships or mm -hmm even football or tango or things like that. And I'm like, we, we can talk, we can write about many other different things. So I see what you're saying about how we Latin Americans are trying to change those stereotypes with, yeah. with media initiatives or cultural initiative, initiatives. Um, let's talk about the concept of Latin urbanism outlined in chapter seven of the book. Yeah. Previous research by Patria identified two key moments in the trajectory of Latin urbanism in London. The first one, which started in 1990s and marks the making of Latin London. And the second that is like 10 years later, by the end of the 1990s, where um, the Latin urbanism is still very rooted in, in our countries of origins, but also we want to cater to, to a local community. And the third one, which is the one you, you, you expand in the book as where we are now, is like a moment of resistance. What you were talking before about regeneration and what just happened in, in that in Elephant and Castle and what the struggles of Seven Sisters. So can you tell us about this chapter and the yeah, book? Yeah, the chapter sort of chronicles um, a third moment in what I call moment of sort of the trajectory of sort of Latin urbanisms in London. Um, and it very much focuses on the struggles of Elephant and Castle Shopping Centre, who that's going to be demolished to give way um, to, to a new development. And in the area, we've registered around 130 sort of um, Latin American businesses around Southwark, um, particularly concentrated in, in, in Elephant and Castle, about 95, only 12, 13 or so are Latin Americans in the shopping centre. Um, but basically BME um, businesses and the same happening in Seven Sisters. We, these have been going on, struggles have been going on to, to defend that space and to keep it part of community sort of assets um, for over 10 years. Um, and in the case of Seven Sisters, coincidentally, it hasn't reopened. They've been in a long battle. They've been given compulsory purchase orders and it hasn't opened since March um, when, when, when the uh, lockdown um, sort of started. Um, and in reopening businesses, they're keeping it closed. So the community's lost two big spaces, community spaces. You know, they are more than just where the businesses um, uh, do their, you know, <laughs> their everyday um, sort of surviving in, in, in the city. Um, what, what, Latin urbanism is a concept that developed in the beginning of the 1990s in relation to Los Angeles, for example, in the United States. And I sort of uh, captured that. It's a very complex process. Uh, it's a very complex term in a way, partly because um, it, 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 it first invokes um, concepts of what being Latin is, of what this Latinidad is about. It's about cultural forms, it's about practices, it's about how um, uh, Latin or, or this idea of Latinidad or, or Latinness is sort of represented in, in, in particular spaces, how places are appropriated for very particular um, functions as well. Um, but it also, um, in the United States, has a longer trajectory because it also captures ideas about the marketization of culture, the changing demographics of Latin American or Latino Latinx population in the United States, um, whereby they cater for different tastes. So it's not the original sort of um, uh, Latin urbanisms, but it's also how it's been used to market to a different category, right, of, of what this Latinidad or Latin is um, all about. Um, so, and, and, and it's about then people begin to think about how can we incorporate um, practices of, 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 of different forms of urbanism that, you know, migrant urbanisms, Latin urbanisms in that respect, also in design and how we think about planning and cities um, in that respect. So it, it goes from theory to practice to, to planning in, 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 in that sense and policy. In the current context, context of, of London and, 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 and also it, it questions how do you avoid stereotyping as well as part mm -hmm. of all of this so it's quite complex but in, the, in, in how I see it in, in London at this very particular moment and I do capture in other, other writings um, 
those two other stages. But this is how is it that cultural forms and practices are used as forms of resistance? And so Latin urbanism and asserting, you know, your right to a culture in a place is the tool to resist gentrification. And this is how I present it in the book. So um, I don't know when we were protesting and going from Elephant and Castle, you know, to, to the Southern Council offices when the planning application was going to be heard, you know, we played bingo because there was a bingo hall used by BME groups and elderly women in particular. So th there was a bingo manifestation performance. There was a salsa performance in the street. Seven Sister has done the salsa um, samba shutdowns, for example. So um, we use empanada um, sort of leaflets um, to assert identity, the piñatas to <laughs> sort of um, destroy the developer, right, with the developer's name. So it's how is it that we assert um, and use a form of, lab, you know, cultural forms and practices as a tool to resist gentrification. So in this context, creating a Latin quarter, creating a market that has Latin connotations within a forms of urbanism is a, is a tool to resist gentrification, is to assert one's right to a culture. It's not about stereotyping. It's not about marketization of culture in that respect. But there is that risk. So how do we avoid that? And, and those are questions I ask myself. Um, how do I avoid not falling on the trap of stereotype or marketization of culture when we're talking about a Latin quarter, when the developer then tells me, oh, yes, a Latin quarter, that will be great. And I think, oh, I think he's thinking of a Latin quarter where you won't find a Latin American mm -hmm. inside, right? Um, so it's how do you avoid that? But I think in this context, it's about that. It's about resisting gentrification. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Patria and Jessica. I have more questions. But as we, but as, but as Jessica said, we we should have twenty four hours to talk about all this. But there are questions from the public as well, and I also want the public to have the opportunity to ask their own questions. So thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing future research from both of you. And uh, Silvia and um, Teresa. Yes, there, there's a lot of questions, and we have uh, only ten minutes, so Teresa is going to read some of them. Yes. Patria and, and Jessica. Yes, thank you guys for fantastic book and and uh, and talk. I'm going to go straight to the to the questions because we don't have a lot of time. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions about Brazilians and how would a Brazilian fit into the Latin X uh, community of the UK? And also, um, they said that uh, Latinidad uh, is an idea that is very cultural and how Brazilians are part of that um, culture and language because they are quite different. And uh, even though Brazilian culture is quite different, they are considered as part of this Latinidad concept. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think resilience is one word I use a lot um, in the book, how Latin Americans have a sense of, um, yeah, it's resilience, what's keeping them fighting for these spaces for so long, basically. And it is a very resilient community, a community that emerges, um, you knock them, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna come back. You know, it's, it's a very resilient. And I think throughout the years, we've seen that it's very um, enterprising and in, in not just on um, business sense, but also um, sort of um, finding ways of surviving in cities. Um, um, and in this particular city that tends to be quite hostile to migrants at times. Um, and Latini, that is a concept that includes, um, yeah, Brazilians as much as, I think Hispanic is the one in the United States that excludes the sort of um, uh, Portuguese um, experience, but no, Latini, that does. Um, and here it, 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 it's this idea of Latin America as a as a, as a political and ideological project of which Brazil is part of that geography as well, right? So it's a geographical, political um, and ideological sort of concept that, that captures um, resilience in, in London. Well, <laughs> everywhere, but yeah. Okay, um, what about divisions within the Latin American community in London, especially in relation to those who came uh, here directly from Spain and are kind of considered Spanish uh, by even by other Latin American people. Can you t tell us a little bit or how did you see this? 
Yeah, um, as I, I think this when when I talked about the British um, Latinidad and how I see it at the beginning, we talked about um, a, a, an idea of Latin America and as a rec, as an ethnic category versus that of a more strategic Ibero-American. And I said how this is fraught with tension within the Latin American um, uh, sort of community in London or communities in London. Um, but this concept that of British Latinidad, in a way, this is ex- sort of captures that tension and captures um, perhaps even more tensions around class and ethnicity. Um, does it capture, you know, um, the, 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 the sort of um, experiences of indigenous black um, Latinos as well? Um, and we want to see it as that is a very heterogeneous concept. We need to think of it not as as, as, as one definition is, 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 is the tension is part of who we are and, and it's part of that conflict of how we defined ourselves. And that's how I see it. I see it in myself as the person in ourselves of communities as well in, in, in London. Um, those divisions are part of it. Um, and there is uh, the concept of British Latini that is fraught with that tension, I feel, um, between the, 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 the Ibero-American and the Latin American, for example. Um, and, and the Spanish people coming here have very different needs as well. Um, and, you know, these are um, things that um, CLAUC, the Coalition of Latin Americans in the UK, have um, taken on board um, very, very, very much. So I would invite you to sort of yeah, find out a bit more <laughs> about that debate through, through that organization. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does the class and generation categories interact in your research? For example, Latino children in the UK or middle class Latinos living in North London. Is there any uh, sort of, ca- of category that you can talk us through? Um, they are there in um, the routes into London. Um, I have... We didn't research with Latino children itself, but it's the parents talking about the children's growing up here, for example. Um, there, are, there are ideas about broken identities, about discontinuities, um, in particular that first generation that left um, Chile, for example, um, in, in a very sort of uh, sudden, abrupt, violent, right, um, um, sort of context. They come here and they feel like there's a sense of rupture and they said this is you know, it was the Chile I knew, then it's my life here in Britain, it's a very different one. And the one with my children, it's it's a very different. So those those things are there, yeah. issues about class, politics, different types of Latin Americans that arrive. You know, the one that comes here, study English, leaves, stays. So I capture it through different narratives. That's why the, the book um, is called Narratives of Migration, because there are loads of little stories. Um, and, and, and we we capture those differences through those stories. Um, issues about isolation or feeling lonely, for example, mm-hmm. about br- breaks in identity as well. Um, I, I want to piggyback in, in, in this yeah. also, uh, trying to answer these last two questions. Uh, um, going back to how heterogeneous we can we can be as Latin Americans, and I see it's a, um, a Venn diagram, right? And then how individual identity and collective identity are also relational. So it depends on who you are talking to and about what, and in what momentum of your life and in, in, in what space. So there's a lot of variables, right? I can be Peruvian to you, but uh, I'll follow Portuguese, so I, I, I can speak with the Portuguese people. And, and my research about Brazilians abroad, uh, for example, Brazilians in, in Japan, it's very interesting because they are second and third generation Japanese Brazilians, but they just speak Japanese. How are they considered uh, in, in Tokyo? That's another story. But we got in second and third generation, a kid that's born in London, the mother Peruvian, the, the, the father from Brazil, that identified themselves as Londoners, right? Mm-hmm. And that's perfectly right. So we shouldn't think about silence, but as fluid, when we talk about our identities, yeah. because we are the Akira, yeah, and our kids are going to be the Akira, yeah, as well. And the fact that uh, Patria and myself, we, have, we are mothers, and that's part of our um, one of the pages in the book, as we're thinking also our kids, because we learn with them uh, how the motherhood in the immigration process as well, right? And how 
uh, integrated that can be and, and, and how we should mm -hmm. see this as an opportunity rather than a challenge that we are richer because we belong to so many different cultures and we speak so many different languages and we like so many different types of food. And that's our richness as Latin American uh, and as Latinx groups. Yeah, I think there's no need to sort of box as one thing is what we're trying to say. It's, it's many things and it incorporates that diversity, that tension and conflict as well, as well as solidarity. We always talk about solidarity and conflict because it, it captures all of those things. Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, uh, time is limited and uh, uh, there were some other questions that we have to finish. I think that Jessica has put in the, in the, in the chat, she has put already where, they ca where you guys can find the book. And um, yes, I don't know if you guys uh, would like to close. I would like to thank uh, uh, Silvia, the London, uh, the London Spanish and Sin Fair, Silvia, Rosis Berger, and Patria and Jessica as well. But I don't know, guys, we have two or one minute to close. So I don't know if you wanted to say anything else. I want to say something. I appreciate that we're all women here. <laughs> beautiful. Okay. Yes. This is beautiful. That's also some other, we didn't have time to talk about that, but uh, we can talk about that, but this is this is beautiful. I'm very emotional that uh, we are all Latin American, Latinx mm -hmm. uh, women here. Thank you. To no, thank you. To I just want you. to thank you for inviting us, and um, thank you, Sylvia, who's also I've worked together with um, <laughs> and who helped us with Latin Elephant from the very beginning. So, um, Sylvia Rothlisberger, um, thank you, thank you for the invitation, and thank you, Sylvia. Demetilia? Demetilia, yes. Teresa <laughs> for also hosting us and, and making this possible. Thank you for uh, all of you because it's been fascinating actually this webinar. Uh, we learn a lot. So this is everything today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. To everyone thank as well, to all the people that joined the meeting as well. Thank you. Thank so you much. to everybody. See you soon. Bye. Okay, bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.